Hey guys, welcome to Eschatology 101. Meow. That's right, we're taking a look at the end, the shape of the end of the story. But in order to do that well, in order to do that in a way that is rich and fulfilling, we also need to look at the story as a whole. So today, you're going to join me in the chopper. That's right, get in the chopper! The chopper! Get in the chopper! The chopper! Get in the chopper! I don't know if I did it right, but... What, do I, what am I talking about? We're gonna get up in uh, a high level view of the biblical story, but it's so big. You know, it, it is, it really is in some ways like the Marvel Cinematic Universe. There's one story that connects all of these narrative threads, all these pieces of prophecy and narrative, genealogies, stories, dialogues, dramas, riddles, Psalms, Proverbs, wisdom literature, gospel accounts, letters written to individuals and communities in the Greco-Roman world. There's so many things happening. It's so hard to take in the big story as a whole. So we're gonna limit ourselves through a motif. And this motif is food. Are you hungry? I'm probably a noisy eater. That's right, did you know? You know, one of the ways we can look at God's intentions and his plan for humanity, where it came from or where it's going, we can trace to the motif of food. So prepare yourselves to explore the Bible, the origin, the frustration, the redemption, and the eschaton of food. Here we go, the Bible through the lens of eating. In the garden, in Genesis chapter one and two, we know that God gave us food. Adam and Eve, what were they supposed to do? They were supposed to grow food in the orchard of Eden. The provision of food was a key part of God's plan for humanity. Doesn't that make you excited? So even in an unfallen earth, there it is, we are invited to the table with God. Part of human identity then, at the origin, is in fact, participating in the co-creative activity of agriculture. That's right, humanity was designed to participate in what we call the cultural mandate, the filling of the earth with God's presence. And part of that task was carried out through the cultivation of food. But as you know, food becomes a centerpiece of the fall. Yes, in Genesis chapter three and four, there is one tree that God said not to eat from. It was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Adam and Eve took of this fruit and in doing so decided what was good for themselves. Rather than depending on what God said was good, they sought moral autonomy. The thing is, guys, it whet their appetite for things that weren't good. Their hungers were changed. You see, up until this point in the biblical narrative, it was God who had decided what was good. And humanity, well, we're not made for this. We weren't made to decide what is good and evil for ourselves. And thus, we ended up craving things and having hungers for things that were not good. Food becomes a thematic way of exploring the brokenness of the human condition. Just as eating the forbidden fruit shows the brokenness of the human condition, we see food show up in ways that define our appetites as broken. Look at Jacob tricking Esau over his birthright. He is using food and craving his own self-interest. Look throughout the biblical narrative for Israel participating in idolatry. Idolatry would have been offering a meal to another god and communing with that very god. The appetite of humanity is not simply craving relationship with God and each other. These were misplaced appetites. Appetites away from the living God. Throughout the Bible, you see this use of moral autonomy that humans actually crave violence. Proverbs 13, 2 says, From the fruit of their lips, people enjoy good things, but the unfaithful have an appetite for violence. The motif of food and hunger is a way to talk about our spiritual cravings and our spiritual brokenness. 
It doesn't get any more vivid than what we see in Exodus 16.3. When the people of God had been redeemed from slavery, this is what they said. If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Guys, do you see the irony of this? They crave captivity rather than freedom with God. This is the corruption of human spiritual appetite. But that's not the whole story of food. Those same people that were grumbling about what to eat, well, God had a solution. He would invite them back to the table. And I know it seems a bit weird, but it had to do a lot with this tent you see in the picture, the tabernacle. And God gave them a whole menu, a whole way of relating to him through food. If you've read through Leviticus, you know there's a lot of different foods that God's people could bring to sacrifice, to the altar, right? Grain, oil, meats, different kinds of animals, and all of this. What do you think they did with it after they offered it to God? Guys, they shared meals with God. In fact, the redemptive process centered around the sacrificial system. It was a whole experiential calendar of worship. If you look at Leviticus chapter 23, there were all kinds of parties, feasts that invited the people to taste the story of God, to remember his redemptive activity. And yes, oftentimes there was the sacrifice of an animal, particularly say with Passover, it was a a lamb, a perfect and spotless lamb that atoned for their sins. So they were immersed in a, a way of reconnecting with God and one another in a way that they could taste. God had invited them back to the table to learn a new appetite, the appetite to be his people and trust in what he said is good once again. And as rich as these holidays were, there were some interesting things about the food code. You see, there was clean food and there was unclean food. See, some of the things you didn't want to eat were vulture, camel, and even pork. Mary Douglas puts it this way in her book, Purity and Danger. If the proposed interpretation of forbidden animals is correct, the dietary laws would have been like signs, which at every turn inspired meditation on the oneness, purity, and completeness of God. By rules of avoidance, holiness was given a physical expression in every encounter with the animal kingdom and at every meal. In other words, guys, the spiritual discipline of eating was to help them train their hearts to be with God. You see, this whole obedience to God thing, well, it had ramifications for how they thought of God and his instructions. In Psalm 19 and Psalm 119, we see this picture of God's word being like honey. You see, God was training the human heart again to taste the good things of God. Rather than our broken, self-centered, self-serving appetites, we invited in through God's word and God's sacrificial system were invited to crave and taste the goodness of God. You hear this in the prophets, Jeremiah 15, 16. When your words came, I ate them, and they were my joy and my heart's delight, for I bear your name, Lord God Almighty. Ezekiel 3, 3. Then he said to me, Son of man, eat this scroll I am giving you, and fill your stomach with it. So I ate it, and it tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. There's a theme that continues to develop that the way we engage with God has a lot to do with how we process and chew on his word. Therefore, God's appeal to redemption sounds a lot like an invitation to a meal. Psalm 34, 8 says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Here, God is recovering a sense of what was lost in the garden that we can again join him at the table and trust in his goodness. And here we see God's redemptive agenda come to a head with the theme of food. It comes to the person of Jesus. Jesus at the table in Luke 22 claims that it's his body that is the bread and his 
blood that is the wine that is broken for us. That sacrificial system that the people were invited to participate in is being fulfilled in the person of Jesus. And in John 1, he is the word. So somehow, God, the host of the table, has become the feast. Indeed, a measure of our redemption is seen through Christ's sacrifice at the table. We are to interpret the invitation to God's redemptive plan in Jesus as an invitation to table, the sacrificial table of Christ himself. As we consume the person of Jesus, so to speak, our appetite is transformed. As we consume the very word of God, we learn to develop a taste for the kingdom. One of Jesus' key teachings in the Sermon on the Mount is, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And in fact, in doing so, we do as Paul instructs in Romans 12, where we actually participate as part of of the sacrifice. We go to the altar ourselves, joining Christ in the self-sacrificial transformation of redemption. No longer are we bound to the narrative of moral autonomy and self-interest, but we are transformed into the kind of people Christ meant for us to be. So as we arrive at the eschaton and we think about the implications for our future, we see in Luke 22:18 that Jesus is still waiting to drink the cup with us again. In fact, Isaiah gives us a picture of an eschatological feast in chapter 25, verse 6. On the, this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats, and the finest of wine. Guys, God is inviting us to the table. Later on in this passage, he will wipe away tears from all the faces. Guys, there is a feast waiting for us. We see this in the new heavens and new earth in Revelation. There were two trees in the garden, one of which God only forbade us from after we broke covenant with him. But that tree reappears. And that fruit, that food that he wanted us to have, the fruit of the tree of life, there it is in the eschaton. God is setting up this incredible meal and he's working this whole redemptive plan to invite us back to the table with him. After all that, what I hope you hear is that God has not scrapped his original plan. And that's important when we're studying eschatology. Meow. That whatever transformative process God is doing through Christ, that he will complete in the eschaton. It's made up of the stuff of the original. There will be fruits in heaven, which means they're going to be eating. No, really, I honestly had this anxiety when I was younger that everybody said, you're not going to need anything when you get to heaven. You're not going to need, you're not going to experience hunger or thirst. So I had this idea in my head, oh my gosh, is there no food? But I like food. Like even when I'm not hungry, I like food. If we're, are we really just going to be sitting around on clouds with harps, singing hymns? So guys, I hope you're beginning to get a sense that the eschaton, whatever it is, and hopefully we'll be able to add some more clarity to that as we look at the resurrection, as we look at this thing called inaugurated eschatology, as we think through the new heavens and new earth, I hope that it will start to get a little more compelling and a little more exciting than not having any food for the rest of eternity. One more time next week, we're gonna get in the chopper and we're gonna look at the Bible story through another important lens. Fam.